Colossians 1, 15 through 19. Now, I'm going to read through this. We've got to break this down. This is where some people go astray, right? And I put this purposely at this point in the, is in the presentation. So let's read through this fully. I want you to see the full flow, and we're going to break it down. Colossians 1, 15 through 19. He is the image, talking about Christ, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Verse 18, he is also head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything, for it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him. Now, stay on the screen right there. Look at that first verse, verse 15. It says, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Now, that firstborn of all creation, in the past, church fathers have taken that phrase and said, ah, there it is. Christ is a created being. It says firstborn right there. Hold on to that thought. We're going to come back to that. Let me address the verses 16 and 17, and then we'll come back to verse 15 and tie it together. Let's go to verses 16 and 17, and I'll break this down. Let's read this one more time slowly. For by him, all things were created. Now, I want to stop right there. You see, your text may say by him. Now, if you really take a close look at the text, you should have a footnote in your study Bible, and it should say in him. For in him, all things were created. See, that's not agency. That's not the means by which things were created. It's saying in him, he's the source. He's the center of creation. Let's keep going. For in him, all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him. Right now, that, ver that through him, that's the agency. That's the means by which anything that has ever been created is created. It's through Christ. And earlier in the first part of the verse, it's in him, all things created. He's the source of everything. Let's keep going. He's all things have been created through him and for him, that last part. So I'm underlining through him and for him, for him, meaning purpose, meaning our justification for existence is for him. It's for Christ, right? He is the beginning. He is all things were created for him. And then verse 17, he is before all things. I've underlined that meaning he is before all things in time. And he is before all things in position and rank. So he's before all things. And last part of that verse, in him, all things hold together. Think about that. In him, all things hold together. Not some things, all things. The entire universe. Now, I'm not a physicist, but how is the universe held together? At least how we understand it through the physicist. They say there's a strong force. There's a weak force. There's electromagnetism. There's, there's uh, gravity. And, and then you've got quantum, quantum mechanics <laughs> uh, overriding all of that. And these are the forces of, that we know of. And they're trying to understand how all these forces fit together into a singular formula. We don't have it yet. But think about this. All things hold together in Christ. He upholds everything in existence. He upholds the universe. From the farthest galaxy on the other side of the universe, he upholds through his power. He upholds the largest black hole. He upholds the smallest atoms, even in this room. Everything, the ground you're standing on, where you may be sitting, where you may be driving, where everything, everything is upheld by Christ. So back on the screen, what I've done is I've summarized this. This is why this, these, these two verses are so key. They're so powerful because on the screen, I've just underscored five elements that are critical to understand the divinity of Christ. The first thing is for in him, all things are created. He's the source. And all thing, things have been created through him. He's the agency. He's the means by which things are created. And they're for him. They're created for him, meaning we have purpose for him. 
He is before all things, meaning he is eternal in time. He is preeminent in everything. And in him, all things hold together. He has the power to hold it all together. That demonstrates divinity right there, those two verses. Now let's go back. Let's go back. Let's go back to verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Let's make sure we understand the context of that. Now, I've underlined three words there. Image, invisible, firstborn. Let me address the invisible. He is the image of the invisible God. Now, on the screen, I've put up there John 4, 24. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. And 1 Timothy 1, 17. Now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible. You see, God is spirit. God is invisible. How can we see that which is spirit? How can we see that which is invisible? Well, Colossians 1.15 says that he is the image. Christ is the image of the invisible God. So image, yes, it's true. That word image is the same word that would be used when Jesus says, you know, what inscription is on that coin for Caesar? That's what, what, what likeness is, what image, you know, can be used for an idol. Like in Romans 1.23, they exchanged the incorruptible God for the, the image of corruptible creatures, man and creatures, right? So that can be used, but Christ is not a graven image. Christ was not made with hands. He's divine, but he expresses the image. He's the image of, of God, the invisible God. So when we see Christ, we're seeing God the Father in his character, in his mind, in his love, in his acts of mercy, in his acts of power. We're seeing Christ. We're seeing God through Christ. Now, here's where people get tripped up a little bit. They say, oh, but look at that last part of the verse. The firstborn of all creation. See, there it is. Christ was created. No, let's make sure that we understand the conscience of this verse. Let me show you this first verse. I should back up. Let me back up real quick about the invisible God, because I want to show you one more scripture verse, John 1, 18. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. Now, no one has seen God at any time. Not even Moses has seen God. All right? He did not see God directly. Not even in, in the visions of Isaiah did he see God directly. But no one has seen God any time. The bosom, the only begotten God who is in the bosom, bosom is basically an expression for something that's very close, an intimate relationship. And saying, he has explained him. Christ has explained him. Meaning Christ is the means by which, Christ, which God is declared. God is revealed. All right? God cannot be seen, but he can be known through Christ. All right? So God reveals his mind, his character, his will, his love, his mercy through Christ. All right? Christ has explained him. Now back to the firstborn. Next verse. I want to show you this. That same word firstborn is used in Luke 2, 7. Luke 2, 7 says, and she gave birth to her firstborn son. This is talking about Mary. And she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now, this word firstborn, in the context, Christ is the first offspring of Mary, right? He's the firstborn. Now, that's the literal application of that word, right? Firstborn. But it can also be figurative, all right? Meaning it's also of special importance, meaning special privileges, because the firstborn in Hebrew, in the Hebrew um, uh, nation had very special privileges. I mean, Abraham had Isaac, then Isaac, Jacob, Esau, you know, the fighting over the birthright. And so the firstborn of a Hebrew held a position of prominence and significance with special privileges. So it's used in a figurative sense to be in a preeminent position, a position of superiority. And Christ takes on this figurative sense of firstborn because when he fulfills his role of redemption for mankind, he, he, is, a, he is, is given that, that attribute of firstborn. Notice this. Let's go to Romans 8, verse 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. Now, how is he the firstborn among many brethren? Because the emphasis here in this particular verse on the screen, firstborn, is on Christ's position of preeminence. 
All right, he's the firstborn of those redeemed. Notice how it says, the firstborn among many brethren. Think about this. God placed himself in humanity, all right? He clothes himself with flesh and blood, all right? In Hebrews 2.11, I don't have it on the screen, but it says, Christ is not ashamed to call them brethren, all right? He had to partake of flesh and blood. He becomes brothers with us, all right? And that's how he becomes the firstborn because he redeems us through his sacrificial act upon the cross. Now think about this. In spite of his vast superiority <laughs> as God, he places himself in human form. He clothes himself with flesh and blood, and he redeems mankind through the cross. So that's why he is the firstborn, because he would even say it to his disciples, greater love has no one than this, than one lay down his life for his friends. Next verse, 1 Corinthians 15, 20, 23. This is not firstborn, but I want you to see the idea of the first, the preeminence the superiority of his position, all right? Verse 20, but now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. Look at verse 23, but each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, after that those who are Christ's at his coming. See, Christ has that preeminent position. Remember, the first fruit, this is pointing back to the, to, the, to the feasts, the festivals. Remember that first fruits, you had the Passover, the unleavened bread, then the first fruits, and the first fruits were waved the day after the Sabbath when the first fruits come in from the harvest in the promised land. And they would wave it before, the priest would wave it before the Lord for you to be accepted. See, Christ on his resurrection day, he became our first fruits. His resurrection is what makes us acceptable to God. The first fruits were to be, to be waved so that you would be acceptable to God. Christ is the first fruits so that we would be acceptable to God. See, he's in a preeminent position here and his resurrection makes us acceptable. That's why he's the firstborn. Notice Revelation 1.5. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead. See, he's the firstborn of the dead because he would pay the price for all of our sins. And he's the first fruits, he's the firstborn, and he would redeem all of mankind. Notice the rest of that verse, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. See, Christ gains the freedom for the entire human race through his resurrection. He has the power to lay down his life. He has the power to raise up his life again. He is therefore in the preeminent position, the firstborn of all creation. Now notice this, Hebrews 1, 6. And when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, and let all the angels of God worship him. Now slow down on this verse right here. And when he, this is God speaking. And when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, and all, and let all the angels of God worship him. Notice the word again. When he again brings the firstborn into the world. Well, there's two aspects to this. Again, Christ was the firstborn at the incarnation. He was also the firstborn at the resurrection because Christ is brought back from the dead. He lays down his own life. He raises it back up again. See, the emphasis is his preeminence. It's not the origin of his creation. No, he has always existed with God the Father. But notice what it says. It says, let all the angels of God worship him. Worship Christ. Notice what it says. It says, because only God should be worshiped. In fact, if you jump ahead to Revelation 22, I'll put this up on the screen again, but remember when John the Revelator is, is getting all these revelations of Jesus Christ and an angel is talking with him and he falls down at his feet to worship him and pick it up in Revelation 22. I'm not going to read this whole, these two verses, eight and nine, but John falls down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed him these things. And the angel said to him, do not do that. I'm a fellow servant of yours. And he says what? At the very end, he says, worship God, right? The angel says to worship God. Now, Hebrews 1, 6, what we just saw, you can go back on the screen, Hebrews 1, 6, all the angels of God are to worship him. They worship Christ. See, the conclusion is Christ is God. If God says all the angels are to worship him, and this angel says, no, only worship God, Christ is God right there. See, the firstborn is not physical birth or creation. It's preeminence in superiority. 
So when we put all of them together, look at Colossians 1, 15 through 19 on the screen. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Then we just address that. For in him, all things were created. All things were created through him, for him. He's before all things. He's in all things. He holds all things together. Now, verses 18 and 19, right there. He is also the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have the first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him. You see, that wraps it up. When Christ completed his work on the cross, all right, he became the perfect expression of the Godhead, of God himself. All right, and, and he became the preeminent of all of creation. That's what the context, the right context of that first one means. Like what you see? Subscribe to our channel on YouTube. Or you can go to angelsintheglen.org. That's angelsintheglen.org. We've got an entire series for you to take you through the events that must take place before Christ returns. God wants his people ready. It's not a time to fear. It's a time to be ready. I hope you'll join us.